Um, let me start off by just asking you, um, do you ever feel like uh, there's just so much that is expected from you in life? I see a few people nodding their heads and mothers in the room are thinking to themselves, mm-hmm, preach, preach, I preach. Hold up now, girl. And mothers are yet. All right, we'll get to that at some point. But like seriously, when you just really think about your, your own life, the relationships in your life, the friendships, the, uh, your work, your ambitions, your future, parenting, all of those kind of things. Do you, how many of us just feel like, there's just so much that is expected of me to have to carry in those spaces, right? A few of us in the room feel like that. that man, there's just so much stuff that is expected of us. In my own life, um, where that really comes to a head is be in the space between family and work. And so trying to lead my life in such a way that my wife will still think I'm awesome. Um, but then uh, also trying to restrain um, uh, three boys from becoming a destructive force into the universe. And then much to my dismay, I discovered time and time again that I did not pick the most easiest vocation in the world as I intended. It turns out trying to actually minister to people's spiritual needs as they will want you to do so isn't a half-day job, right? They lie to you at Bible College where all them doctrinal books, they have you reading, thinking like this here thing will prove to be easy. It ain't that easy at all. Now, I'm sure you've got your own stories and your own experiences, experiences of how you're trying to juggle and balance all that's expected of you in this life and being like, Phew, it just feels like it is too much. And so then the question becomes, how can we have, uh, have or make much significance in our lives if we're feeling that burden, that weight, over us all the time. Now, let me just tell you where I'm not going with this message so that we can get that disappointment out early. I'm not going to launch into a five easy practical steps to getting it all done message. That's perhaps for another day. day. But like where I'm going with this feeling that of just being overloaded or carrying a lot of expectations of our lives, I'm simply going, uh, going to a point where I want to point out to you that that feeling, that overloaded feeling is also a feeling that we can have towards God at times too, right? Feeling like God is expecting way too much from me. And so that whether that is in the things you do or don't do, or in the things you have or don't have, or the desires that you, you have or do not have, I feel like, feel like God is expecting too much on me, uh, uh, from me. And so they may lead uh, uh, to some of us um, not rejoicing as we should be in our Christian lives. Perhaps they lead some of us who feel like, man, is it really worth it, for, uh, worth it to try to pursue this God? Or perhaps they lead some of us not wanting to get close to really know this Christian God. Why? Because we, we anticipate or are expecting that his expectation may prove to be too much, too much to a handle of uh, our lives. We've been talking in the, last, uh, in the past two weeks about having faith. That is trusting God, that God has established us on a solid foundation of salvation. Trusting that his power is guarding us. Trusting that our trials are being used by our God to actually refi uh, refine us. But can we just be honest for a moment and just say that having to have faith in God it's not always easy. It's not always, uh, always something we look forward to try to do, especially when it comes to God. A lot of the things that he calls us to trust in and believe in are not visible to the naked eye, right? We're called to trust that we're being founded on a solid foundation of faith, which isn't always visible to the naked eye. We're called to actually trust that God, uh, the truth of God's power is actually guarding and preserving our lives, which isn't always that visible to the naked eye. We're called to believe and trust that God is using our pain and our suffering to actually refine the proven genuineness of our faith, which isn't always that visible to the naked eye. And so there's this burden of expectation to trust and believe that God is at work in my life, which isn't always a perceivable, that, uh, a perceivable or visible. And so can lead 
to a, 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 us feeling like, sure, God is expecting a lot from us. And so what are we to do in the midst of that? Now, the Apostle Peter knew a little bit about this dilemma. And so, and so in what he writes next in his letter, in 1 Peter, by way of implication, he wants us to actually realize, uh, realize how we can actually shoulder this calling of our salvation in a way that is viable in how we lead lives of effectiveness and significance for our Lord. And so if you have a Bible, come to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 8 and 9. Peter writes in, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so we've already looked at how salvation, biblical salvation, is actually a journey. It begins at your conversion, but must be brought to completion in death and at Christ's ret uh, return. Now, that truth is being affirmed again here in this text. Verse 9, uh, verse nine obtaining, that is present, in a present continuous sense, the outcome of your faith. And so this present continuous believing in God has an outcome the salvation of your souls. And so biblical salvation is not just an event, but it is actually a journey, a journey where I have to exercise persevering faith throughout my life in trusting and believing God. Then Peter tells us that that persevering faith is actually seen in the love, belief, and joy we have in our unseen Lord. And so look at verse 8 again. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. And so oof, there again, that burden of expectation, right? Loving, believing, and rejoicing in a Lord that I have not seen. How do I do that? Are we just supposed to bait fuss through this whole thing, right? And just have a love, have a belief, have a joy in your unseen Lord. It will be okay, Kulungile. Don't worry about it. Just persevere through that. Now, the Christian life is actually far more helpful than that. And living for God is actually far more tangible than that. Now, in order to see that, you have to ask yourself the question or think through this question. How does one have a love, a belief, and a joy in someone they have not seen? How does one have a love, a belief, and a joy in someone they have not seen? seen. And so the Apostle Peter wants us, as we're thinking through that very question, to actually realize the two means, the two means by which one can sustain a love, a, a, a belief, and a joy in someone they have not seen. Two means by which we could do that. And as we exercise these means, and as we allow these means to play itself out in our lives, there will lie our true love, our true belief, and our true joy in our unseen Lord. And so what are those two means by which we can sustain our love, our belief, and our joy in our unseen Lord? Now, the very... Uh, not first the time I met Stephanie, who would later become my wife, she actually did one of the weirdest things I've ever had experience in my life. She actually grabbed my two hands in her hands. Not at all an awkward thing to have happened to this introvert who doesn't even hug people by nature, but she took my two hands, and I'm thinking to myself, what on earth is happening right now? 
pretty Caucasian girl. What are you doing? Right? And she's grabbing my hands. So she grabbed my two hands and then said these very words. She said, it is so lovely to finally meet you. I have heard so much about you that I feel like I already know you. Now, that statement should have been a dead giveaway to the brother. A dead giveaway, right? That the girl was already hooked, right? And who could blame her? I mean, like, you just you're like, we understand, right? Like, it makes all, all it makes sense, right? And so, and so it was uh, uh, her first uh, evening in South Africa on a short-term mission trip from the U.S. Now, she had come with a group of, studen- uh, of students from America to do some ministry on the UJEC, uh, UJEC campus. And the guy who had been discipling me three years prior to that very evening, his wife had discipled Stephanie in the U.S., and when that couple moved over to South Africa to do this similar work, Stephanie, I kept tabs uh, with them. Now, every winter, there will be a group of uh, students who would come to, uh, to do some cross-cultural ministry on, uh, on the UJ campus. And, she, and through that, that couple and, and those groups, she kept on hearing things about me, uh, uh, about me. Now, if you catch Stephanie at the right time, right? She will admit to you that through what she was hearing about me, that the idea of me seemed somewhat appealing to her. Now, there must be some strong appeal there eh? <laughs> to begin to catch feelings for a brother you've never met or you've even uh, uh, never seen before. Now, why am I telling you the story? I'm not telling you the story to try to reveal how great of a catch I was for my wife, right? We know it's true, but that's not the point of, of the story. But why I'm telling you the story is because we've all felt something similar to you in our lives, right? Uh, having a feeling, a, a feeling towards somebody, even perhaps a love or even a, an unreserved trust to their, uh, towards them, simply on the basis of what you have heard being said about them, right? That, that is fair. That sometimes your connection and even your sense of trust towards them can be equally powerful if you perceive that what you are being told about them is actually sincere and true. And so what does this, uh, this reveal? It actually highlights to us the power or beyond the testimonies that we hear about people. Now, similarly, it applies to someone you've never met before in your life, but whom you do not like. And so let's say Adolf Hitler, for example, right? Though you've never met him, right? And most of us, I would think, have never met him in, in our lives, but through what you have heard about him, and here's the second thing, the impact you're seeing them have on other people's lives can be enough to actually have you dislike them or have a sense of repulsion towards them, even though you have never met them before. And so here's my one and only point this morning, and it is simply this, the testimonies we hear and the impact of Jesus we see are the means to sustain a love, belief, and joy in our sin, Lord. That's it. That's what Peter is implying, that the testimonies we hear and the impact of Jesus we see are the means to sustain a love, belief, and joy in our unseen Lord. Look at the text again, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. How do you love him? Well, it is through what you have heard about him, who he is, what he has done for you at the cross that actually brings you to a place where you can say, I love him. And so the apostle John will go on to write in his epistle saying, saying, now this is love. Not that we love God first, but what, but what happened? That he loved us through what he did for us, and it is through uh, having heard what God has done for us and understood that, that then leads us to develop a love for that, uh, for that God, for that Lord. And not only that, though you do not see him, but what do you see? You see the impact and feel the impact that he is having upon your life if you're truly believed in him. 
in how he's transforming you into your character and your conduct into the likeness of his own son. And not only is that observable in your life if you are truly believed and trusted in Jesus, but you then see it at work in your uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ too. There's nothing, nothing more powerful that could develop a love for Jesus Christ than to seeing his impact, the impact he's having upon real lives. Upon real lives. And so that's why you respond in love for him. The verse continues, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. Again, how? How are you to trust someone whom you've never met before? The answer is actually simple. (laughs) If you're introduced to them and meet them. That's the answer. And so you meet Jesus Christ through the words you hear about Jesus Christ. And the impact you see him having on people's lives, on someone's life. That's how you meet Jesus. And that, seeing, hearing that, and seeing that impact can begin to sustain and develop a belief, a trust in Jesus Christ that leads you to experience great joy in Jesus. Now, one of the things I will remember always about the night that I first met Stephanie was how happy she was in meeting me. And so she grabbed my my two hands and said the words, it is so lovely to finally meet you. I've heard so much about you that I feel like I know you. She said that with the biggest smile I've ever seen on a face of a person that I'm meeting for the very first time. 15 years later, I can still remember it vividly. Now, here's what I later came to understand about this joy, because it was clearly a joyous occasion for her. But I understood later that the joy that she had at meeting me that very first time wasn't actually a joy that she just exuded spontaneously, but it was a deeper joy that was already existing within her. Why? Because of the things she heard about me. Listen, brother and sister in Christ, that's the kind of joy we're called to have for our God to experience in this life through the things we hear about our Lord Jesus Christ and the impact we see him having, though we have not seen him. We love him, we believe in him, and we have great joy in him. And one day, that glorious day will come when we will see him face to face and obtain the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our soul. And in that, we rejoice, not just then, but we rejoice in the presence too. And so listen, it is the testimony, the testimony that we are by Jesus Christ, the Word, and and the impact of Jesus that we see, the power of Him transforming people's lives, that actually leads us to sustain, sustain, a love, belief, and joy in our unseen Lord. And so to us in the room today, we will call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. Then the question and the challenge to us is, then what sort of testimony about Jesus Christ are you portraying or, or, or delivering deliver, uh, delivering to the world? What, imp- what of his impact is actually on display of his impact on your life, on display for the world to see. That's what we need to be asking ourselves because it is through that testimony and through that impact that others will begin to develop as well a love, a belief, and a joy in our seen Lord. Or we people, people, we are content to say, well, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this month. I trust in the Lord Jesus, but this anxiety that I'm, that I'm experiencing, when will he lift it up? I believe in Jesus, but life is too tough right now for me to rejoice in him. What is our testimony? 
and our pe uh, people observe as they observe our testimony. Is it leading them? Is it leading them to develop a love, a belief, and a joy in Jesus Christ because of the impact they are seeing him have on you? You want to live a life of significance? Lead your life towards that end. Towards that end. As a brother, as a sister in Jesus Christ. And so in conclusion, here's just a summary. The things we hear about Jesus and the impact of Jesus that we see is what we need if we are to sustain a persevering faith in our Lord. And that's what we're called to as Christians, as people who are found in Jesus Christ to persevere. And yes, life will throw at us various curveballs and it will be hard and at times we'll feel like, sure, the call of our salvation seems too much to bear, that too much is expected of us. But it is in those moments where we've got to seek and place ourselves in spaces where we can hear of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and see his impact on the lives of those who truly believe in him. That's the only way you'll be able to sustain a persevering faith in the Lord. And there is no better place in the whole world. No better place in the whole world to both see the impact that Jesus is having on real life and hear about who this Jesus is than in a good and functioning community of his people. No better place other than that. And so here's the final exhortation. Therefore, participate. Participate. Participate in the life of a local church, which is the expression of Jesus' body into a small group of people where you'll be constantly be reminded, yeah, about who he is and be seeing the impact that he's having on real life so that you will be sustained in a love, a belief, and a joy in your unseen God. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you do not leave us as orphans and even as uh, Peter will go on, to write in his second letter that your divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And so I want to pray for us as a church. I want to pray for us as, as family. I want to pray for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Give us the faith to believe that that everything we could ever need in this life, you have given. You have given through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. Father, you have not been stingy towards your children, but you have been gracious and abounding in love by granting us what we would need. That this life of salvation that we ought to live is a viable life. We can persevere as Christians, as salt and light in, to this world, if we will take you at your word. That it is in your knowing of you, which is done so through the testimony of your word and through the testimony of our brothers and, and sisters in Christ. And it is in seeing the impact of Jesus Christ. Nothing can transform a human life into an object of God's glory apart from Christ Jesus. And we in the church get to see that. We're welcome to be a part of, a part of that. Seeing those miracles of grace that you're bringing forth in your church. I pray that, Lord, we will believe in that and we will center our lives around that so that by your grace, by your goodness, we will lead lives of significance to your glory. And all God's people say, Amen.